The great mass of all armies were compromised of foot soldiers who invariably suffered the heaviest casualties and usually decided the outcome of battle. Infantry was not only the most numerous unit type during the revolutionary and Napoleonic time, but also one of the most versatile and effective. It was capable of both ranged and hand-to-hand -hand combat, it could be used in almost all terrain and compared to cavalry and artillery was also quite cheap. So let's take a look at infantry combat and tactics during the era of Napoleon. Basically there were two types of infantry, although some authors note up to three. Now the two types were the line infantry and the light infantry. Infantry units carried several different names depending on the nation which raised them. But generally line infantry consists of any infantry formation known as infantry de lit, infantry, musketeers, grenadiers or guards. Light infantry consists of any formation known as chasseurs, jägers, Freiwillige Jägers, Pandors, Schützen, Infanterie Lecheur or Light Infantry. The term Fusilier, unfortunately, can denote either. The Line Infantry was the regular infantry, fighting in the line of battle, in closed order formation. Whereas Light Infantry usually fought in skirmish or open order formation. As you can see, there's a clear difference between closed order and open order formation. The closed order formation of the Line Infantry focused mainly on control, discipline, cadence marching, volley fire and rigid maneuvers. Whereas the light infantry was about initiative, flexibility, terrain focused movement, individual fire and cover. The main function of the line infantry was to hold and take ground, inflict damage on the enemy with volley fire and force him from the battlefield with bayonet charges. It constituted the majority of the troops. Whereas light infantry was more about harassing and disturbing the enemy, like provoking him to fire volley early to waste ammunition or reduce temporarily the firepower of the unit, since the reloading time was rather long. Light infantry was also about exploiting opportunities yet avoid major confrontation. Light infantrymen hid behind rocks and bushes when they fought and were used to harass the enemy line infantry as well as to screen their own. Light infantry could, if required, operate as line infantry and depending on the nation did so to greater or lesser degrees. To oversimplify it a bit, light infantry was about annoying the enemy and covering the flanks of the friendly line infantry. Yet in terms of equipment besides the weapons, there were only minor differences. Of course you need to keep in mind that it should be clearly understood that there are almost always exceptions to any rule one might establish for this period. That said, some words about the basic weapon of the infantry. This was the smoothbore flintlock musket which had a rather large caliber by modern standard of around 17.7mm up to 19.3mm, depending on the respective weapon. For comparison, here's a World War II rifle and a contemporary US carbine. As you can see, both the calibers and lengths have been reduced quite significantly. Although some muskets were better than others, some authors note that the differences between the different muskets were quite small. One key limitation of the musket was its limited accuracy due to low muscle velocity, large windage, no rifling and limited training of the troops. Now a regular musket had a smoothbore barrel whereas rifles were rifled. Although rifling made a shot more accurate, it had more drawbacks. One might wonder why rifles were not common on the battlefield. There were several reasons. First, they were significantly more expensive. In addition, they were slower to fire as shown by Shanhua's study. They often required a mallet to pound the ball into position. They usually required better grades of powder, required custom manufactured balls and fouled too easily. Thus rifles were generally only given to light infantry since for them accuracy was of greater importance than the rate of fire. Yet even there it was rare that an entire battalion was equipped with rifles. As such they were often just issued improved smoothbore muskets. Now time to look at formations. These were and are important for various reasons. They influenced mobility and combat capabilities. Note that most of these formations were for battalion sized units upwards. Yet to the size restrictions I often use smaller units for illustration purposes. So let's look at some of the most important formations. At first is the line. It was well suited for firefights and also the base formation. This is also reflected by the name line infantry. Since the line infantry focused on mass and volley fire, it was the key to maximize the amount of firepower on a limited area. As such, these formations were rather dense. The line usually had a depth of two to three men. The French usually had a depth of three, whereas the British used two men. Now for the French it is important to note that the third rank was not shooting over the heads of the men in front of them. Instead, 
they stepped to the side. Besides maximizing firepower, the line had several other strengths as well. Due to the lack of death, artillery fire with round shots could inflict only minor damage from the front. Additionally, since the frontage was rather wide, the chances of outflanking were also reduced. Yet many of these aspects were weaknesses as well. For instance, the line was not really well suited for moving forward since it was difficult to maintain the long stretched formation even in regular terrain. During combat one key problem was the lack of death, as such it could be easily penetrated. Additionally its flanks were unprotected, this meant that attacks from the side, especially by cavalry, could have devastating results. At Albuera, Colborn's brigade deployed in line was blinded by a sudden rain squall and when it lifted, two French light cavalry regiments fell on its flanks. Within 5 minutes three of its battalions, lacking time to form squares, were annihilated. Out of a total of 80 officers, and 1568 men, 1248 were dead, wounded or captured. The other key formation that addressed several of the weaknesses of the line was the column. The column was ideally suited for marching and advancing, in which even untrained troops could easily remain in formation. Marching columns, as distinct from attack columns, were used to bring troops into range. The resulting depth and cohesion of the column provided a natural defense against cavalry attacks. Due to its mass, the column was well suited for charges or holding the ground against enemy advances. The main weaknesses of the column were its vulnerability to artillery fire and skirmishes due to the death. Additionally, only a fraction of the theoretical firepower of a unit in column could be brought into action. Due to the various weaknesses and strengths of the line in column, it was thus a common approach to use the column to get into range and deploy into a line to conduct the firefight. Hence key maneuvers on the battlefields were to deploy from column into line or vice versa. Of course there was also the possibility to combine line formations with column formations and also open order formations. This was called the mixed order formation that was used extensively by Napoleon. This formation provided significant firepower from the battalion in line and at the same time allowed for shock from the columns while also protecting the vulnerable flanks of the battalion in line. But this formation required a high level of training and proficiency, as detailed in the Reglement du Erlat, 1791. The next formation, like many of you know from a computer game, it is the square. Now Nosworthy has a very interesting note here on the squares. A variety of formations, all with the distinguishing characteristics of being either rectangular or square in shape. These were defensive formations used to protect infantry from cavalry attacking the flank or rear. Although most drill booklets call for cavalry squares, this was commonly recognized as being less than useless and wasn't used in practice. Note that some other authors don't dismiss the square at all or less strongly. Additionally, it also depends on the circumstances. For instance, Napoleon in Egypt had a severe lack of cavalry as such he used large hollow square formations as pointed out by Northworthy. Note there existed various variations of the square and again the unit size has to be taken into account as well. As such I am not entirely sure how valid Northworth's comment is. Now there are various issues with the square that are less apparently initially. First it was almost a passive formation since movement was very limited. On top of that maneuvering into a square formation was difficult and required precise timing. As such the unit could be even more vulnerable than before. At the same time the firepower of the unit was severely reduced, so if enemy infantry was close by this was a major weakness. And finally and worst of all, squares constituted prime targets for artillery. Now let's look at some basic forms of combat for the infantry, namely volley fire, skirmishing and the charge. Volley fire is when an organized group of a unit fires simultaneously. It was the most effective form of fire for the line infantry, whereas individual fire or running fire was mostly ineffective. Once the fire became general, that is, once devolved into each man firing at will, it became relatively ineffective. Note that the effectiveness of volley fire was determined by many factors and throughout the literature the British are noted to be the most effective in that regard. Some argue that this was due to the British holding the fire till the very last moment and better training. Muskets as mentioned before were very inaccurate, as such the focus was put on ensuring mass of fire and high rate of fire, as outlined by these two authors. Because the muskets were such notoriously inaccurate weapons, the best method of ensuring a hit was to mass fire and point it in the general direction of the enemy. 
Russian experiments revealed that a slight angling of the stock would have greatly improved accuracy, but tactical doctrine still called for the highest volume of fire possible in a short time and not for individually aimed fire. It should be noted that the rate of fire was extremely low by modern standards, especially since up to 17 separate steps could be required to reload a musket. Theoretically, 4 to 6 shots per minute were possible according to some authors. It would drop after the first minutes to 2 or 3 rounds, whereas other authors note that on average 2 rounds per minute for trained troops should be assumed and that after several minutes this rate would drop further. Due to heat, the low quality powder which led to falling of the barrel and worn flints that could lead to misfires. Now the opposite to volley fire was aimed individual fire of the skirmishers, which were usually light infantry, yet clearly not exclusively. Skirmishing fulfilled several functions, like harassing the enemy with individual fire, scouting, protecting the flanks and taking difficult terrain. There were very few formal instructions for skirmishing, an instruction for the service and maneuvers of light infantry written in 1804 by Colonel Guyard suggests skirmishers might be deployed by sending one or two fires from each platoon ahead to scout the way ahead or protect the flanks. Skirmishers usually worked in pairs and took turns as such, one would protect the other while reloading. Unlike infantry in line or column formation, they relied on mobility, initiative and use of terrain. If charged by enemy cavalry, skirmishers were advised to hide in holes, ditches and hedges from where they could continue to fire on the horsemen safely. If this was not possible, they were to run back to the nearest reserve. It is important to note here that skirmishers were not free roaming soldiers taking pot shots at any possible moment. Similar to volley fire, control and timing was crucial. The officer's duty was to control the skirmishers and just prior to the commencement of the main attack point out what portions of the enemy's line or position they were to fire upon. Because one countermeasure against skirmishers was to deploy skirmishers as well. Another regular combat form was the charge, usually performed by the line infantry with bayonets. The interesting aspect here is that many contemporaries noted that the bayonet decided the battle. Yet this statement taken without context can be misleading, since while well, it is not confirmed by most data available. After studying the casualties suffered by units in a number of hand-to-hand -hand combats, Surgeon General Larray of the Grand Army found only 5 bayonet wounds and concluded that the effect of the weapon was primarily psychological. One of Wellington's senior medical officers made a similar conclusion. The observation of the medical men are supported by the experienced officers. Similarly, Crowdy notes about the bayonet charge. The moment of impact is rarely described simply because it rarely occurred. Either the advancing force was shot to pieces and lost its cohesion before the moment of impact or the defending force did not stand to meet the charge. So in other words, the charge had a prime influence yet rarely led to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, as one would assume. Well, this was just a brief look at the various aspects of infantry combat during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Of course, the hard part was to put everything together at the right time, which becomes very apparent if one looks at the weaknesses and strengths of formations like the line and column. As such, proper and timely execution of maneuvers was very crucial, especially considering the rather large formations and the rather rigid maneuvers. And remember, maneuver is one of the two basic components of combat, the other is firepower. If you like well-sourced content like this, consider supporting me on PayPal, Subscribestar or Patreon. Thank you here to North and Stratford for helping me out with some data. Special thanks to Jack and Nuclear Jacker here for sending me books that were used yet not harmed during the making of this video. Sources in the description, thank you for watching and see you next time.